Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. Today our topic matter will be on attention deficit and ADHD, which is a hyperactivity uh, uh, quotient added to that. Uh, I'd like to first of all talk about the symptoms and some of the causes that we know that we're aware of contribute to ADD or ADHD. First of all, um, when we're looking at symptoms, we're talking about a restlessness and impulsiveness, um, inability to concentrate, uh, going down short attention, impaired memory, poor coordination and coordination uh, motor skills, actually physical uh, movement issue skills. Uh, speech or learning uh, disorders that are affected by it. Um, when we're looking at who suffers from it most often, it tends to be three times more likely that boys will suffer from ADD and ADHD. Um, it affects children as well as adults. When we uh, look at this, sometimes we think, okay, we've taken care of the kids, we've given them their medication, and oh, they're adults now, they don't need it anymore because the teacher doesn't require them to sit down in a desk and be quiet all the time. When we're looking at ADD and ADHD, it isn't just a childhood disorder, disease, malnutrition, whatever. We'll talk about those issues later on. It is truly symptomatic whether you're an adult or a child, and it can be healed, particularly when we address these factors that contribute towards ADD and ADHD. Um, the common factor that we have is, is a coordination factor within the brain. There's certain um, uh, hormones, neurotransmission action that takes place that uh, doesn't take place in ADHD kids, so they're all over the place. Or they can stay extremely focused on one thing and not on anything else. They can't multitask oftentimes. Um, the root causes, and these are the ones that are probably the most researched as far as root causes are concerned. Uh, number one, diet high in sugar and food add additives and chemicals. Sugar is what we call an excitotoxin. It gets the brain very, very excited and hyperactive. That's why sometimes you'll notice even the kids who aren't ADD or ADHD, they get active. Their minds get active, their bodies get active, they circle around. Sometimes they'll even mumble things that come off the wall. They physically become uh, sometimes even aggressive. The food additives and food chemicals are what we call sensitivities. There are certain ones like red dye number 40, uh, the Blue Lakes, that literally once again go into the brain and act as excitotoxins. It gets the brain to be overexcited, uh, working on different parts of the, of the brain, sometimes uh, preventing increasing impulsiveness or compulsiveness to do something. Uh, so watching and looking for chemicals, food additives, very, very important to recognize that as a contributing uh, factor. Food allergies, uh, particularly to wheat, dairy, soy, peanuts, peas, I mean the list can go on. And we'll talk about some of the tests that are necessary or that I think physicians should uh, perform before they do put a child ever on an ADD or an ADHD medication. Those food allergies can cause inflammatory issues both in the body and in the brain and interfere with the proper um, usage of the brain. Uh, once again, can become excitotoxins or block certain chemical reactions that have to occur in the brain for thought processes. Uh, hypoglycemia and nutritional deficiencies. Hypoglycemia, blood sugar issues. Uh, blood sugar issues we know with us adults, just like I was discussing earlier, when you have excessive amounts of sugars in these ADD and ADH kids, it can make them hyperactive. Well, hypoglycemia or diabetes affects how they utilize sugar. Uh, nutritional deficiencies, certain vitamins that they're missing, nutrients that are necessary for brain development and brain function. With this fast food, give them the McDonald's, shove them with a bowl of cereal in the morning out the door to school, uh, it, it doesn't work. And then parents wonder why the kids have ADD and ADHD. Oh, I'm giving them the bowl of cereal, we're going to McDonald's, yeah, we have good nutrition. No, you don't have good nutrition. And we'll talk about that a little further on about what good nutrition is for ADD and ADHD kids. Um, poor digestion and absorption having to do particularly maybe with an overusage of antibiotics. Antibiotics destroy the good bacteria in the bowel. And when that bacteria goes, hence goes the digestion and the, and the um, formation of serotonin and some other key um, abilities to absorb nutrients and key uh, neurotransmitters for the brain. 
So uh, we have one physician in town, Dr. Blyfeld, whenever she puts a baby on antibiotics, in come the parents to get the probiotics because the good bacteria get replaced whenever there's any antibiotic usage. And these antibiotics nowadays that are being used are very, very strong. K-Flex, Cipro, they kill everything in sight. And so when we don't have these adequate layers of bacteria, we can't absorb the nutrients. Um, heavy metal poisoning. And this can come from vaccines. This can come chomping on the paint. This can come from chewing on, or kids and babies chewing on, uh, things made from China that are high in lead and chemicals. It can come from water. It can come from foods and the chemical pesticides. All that can be heavy metal uh, poisoning that can contribute to how the brain functions. Mercury fillings. Uh, mercury, neurotoxin to the brain. I mean, YouTube has a wonderful demonstration of a 25-year-old mercury filling, and you can just see the mercury vapors. And mercury doesn't allow the um, uh, proper replication of nerve cells. So kind of vital uh, and a contributing factor. Emotional stresses. Um, in this time and age when parents are both working, there doesn't seem to be as much family life. They don't sit down at the dinner table together. They do do a lot of things together. The families are doing, I'm on the computer, you're doing this and that. They're not doing things together. Some of the family stresses, there's not as much family support for the kids. And then you turn around and add in the television. There was a really wonderful television study that came out, conducted in kids between two and four years old. Watching more than a couple hours of TV a day rewires and hardwires the brain to where it needs immediate gratification, it needs immediate stimulation to where a lot of these kids could not sit down and do their math or do their reading. They needed to have something that continually kept them entertained and that goes for computer games and other things at early ages. It hardwires and rewires the brain. So parents need to keep in mind to limit that to some extent. Um, premature birth and family history. Um, family history and how we're hardwired in the brain can and does affect uh, how we think, uh, how we store information, how we process information, our RNA, DNA, what we pass on to our, our kids, the good, bad, and ugly, get passed on through the brain as well. And then with premature birth, the lack of oxygen or the ability to oxygenate seems to be a contributing factor to ADD and ADHD as well. When we're looking at diet, and I think diet, ah, before you look at anything, before you start throwing your child on any ADD or ADHD medication, you got to look at diet. And I mean truly look at diet. Just don't look at it and say, this is what I had, everything worked out great when I was a kid. you got to look at what's in your child's diet. Only fresh fruits, vegetables, clean meats, things that don't have processed chemicals in them. So if you're grabbing the most of your, I used to tell people shop the perimeter of the grocery store. When you're grabbing things off the middle shelves, you're going to get preservatives, you're going to get chemicals, you're going to get dyes, you're going to get all that. But you're grabbing the broccoli and the celery and the peanut butter and the eggs and milk. Those are things, well particularly if you're looking at the organic milks, that don't have chemicals added to them. They don't have dyes added to it. Um, meats you have to be aware of too. They do use red dyes and chemicals in those as well. So when you can get organic meats or meats that aren't treated with sodium nitrates and other dyes, very beneficial uh, for in kids or adults that have ADD or ADHD. Avoiding sugar, including candy, soda, sweets, white flour products. Trying to keep the blood sugar stable is vital in any person, whether you have ADD or ADHD, in order for the thought process to occur in a regular, formatted way, not in a disjointed way. So keeping the sugar stable, and if someone has blood sugar issues, making the extra effort to make sure that there's protein, fats, and a small amount of carbohydrates with each meal. Not just sitting going out the door with the Pop-Tarts or the bowl of cereal, that's only carbohydrates. Proteins are really, really necessary in order for the brain to function, and if you don't have adequate amounts of protein, it ain't gonna happen. 
Um, avoiding certain foods that cause allergies. And, I, and later on I talk about certain testing that needs to occur, but there is, um, some physicians will put their patients on what's called a food elimination diet, where you eliminate certain known common allergens, including things like wheat, dairy, corn, chocolate, peanuts, citrus, soy products, um, things that you know maybe you observe in your child when they eat cause a behavioral change. So I know that doesn't leave much. <laughs> it leaves kind of fruits and vegetables, rice, good wholesome non-nitrate meats, looking at those real good wholesome foods, not out of the box, not out of a fast food restaurant, something good and wholesome for three meals. Not just, gee, we, have, we hurry up on, on breakfast, we have a lousy lunch, and oh, we'll make dinner good. These need to be three good meals, and that goes for adults, ADD and ADHD as well. When we're talking about supplements that we know can help with ADD and ADHD, there's several of them. Um, not one in particular more important than the others, but I have tended to prioritize in what I believe is some of the most important uh, for ADD and ADHD people. And I'm not just going to say children here, people. Uh, essential fatty acids, those good fats. Remember the brain consists of about 60% of a fatty acid cholesterol content. So if you don't have adequate amounts of fatty acids in the diet, be it supplementation, nuts, avocados, things like that, then the brain isn't going to transport or relay information. Um, calcium, magnesium. Most of our foods nowadays, particularly in our chemical fertilizer uh, agriculture arena, do lack the calcium, magnesium, and minerals necessary for uh, uh, calming, to be calm, to be able to stabilize the muscles and keep them relaxed. Most everybody is so full of garbage that they don't have adequate, that actually literally block the nutrients and block the calcium magnesium absorption that they can't even calm the muscles down. Magnesium is also necessary to help with sleeping on ADD and ADHD people, particularly in the evening hours when you want to go to sleep. Phosphatidylserine is a key fatty acid, and if you notice on here, I have some pretty high dosages. Uh, a lot of uh, my customers will come in, and I, we had really one terrific uh, uh, endocrinologist that would recommend phosphatidylserine whenever you have memory issues. Um, what phosphatidylserine, key fatty acid that helps with short-term memory, the storage of information, and the retrieval of information. Um, Remember how earlier we talked about how antibiotic usage was linked to some of the ADD and ADHD? Well, the probiotics, like for example, that Dr. Blyfeld recommends, the good bacteria aid that digestion, aid the absorption of nutrients. Yogurt is not sufficient, um, not to cover after a uh, antibiotic is used, because antibiotics destroy trillions of these little critters. You're lucky if you get a million of them in a good yogurt. Uh, a multivitamin that's high in Bs, very, very important for metabolism of protein, helps with brain functions, and B6 in particular is necessary for serotonin production. So a good multi. We're not talking about grabbing one off the grocery store shelf. We're talking about getting a one that, once again, has no chemical dyes, no junk. Real important for parents to turn it over and say, hey, if I don't recognize what's on the back of this label in these crackers, in these vitamins, I'm going to look it up, number one, to find out what it is, and number two, I'm not going to buy it until I know what it is. Um, tryptophan. Uh, we have a couple of physicians in town that rep, um, recommend tryptophan for uh, aiding with sleep. It helps with serotonin production and utilization and help, can help kids and adults sleep a little bit better. It's an amino acid that you take on an empty stomach. We discussed uh, B6 already. Iron. Um, oftentimes, kids are very low in iron now. Um, the foods just don't have the iron that they used to. The spinach, forget it. Unless it's organic and they're using trace minerals, spinach is not going to be a high source of iron. Popeye's theories of iron getting aren't there no more. It's just not in our food. 75 years ago, we wouldn't be having this discussion, but our agriculture has changed a lot. So making sure that the iron levels are within normal range, I mean, man, you add a 
a good whole food iron that the body recognizes in a non-ferrous sulfate form. Ferrous sulfate causes severe constipation and actually is a toxic chemical. Uh, so if you can find your child as low in iron as a contributing factor to ADD and ADHD, get the iron levels up with a natural source iron that you can get in there. It's ferrous gluconate. There's whole food sources. Vitamin C. Vitamin C helps cleanse toxins, heavy metals, and helps with physiological stresses in the body. Keeping a dosage good in kids of 500 to 2,000 milligrams per day of a mineral ascorbate. We're not talking ascorbic acid that we draw, grab, grab off the standard drugstore shelf. We want a good mineral ascorbate vitamin C that sticks in the body more than just a couple of hours. GABA has been used, uh, amino acid that can help calm you down, um, particularly uh, if someone tends to have anxiety associated with uh, ADD and, or ADHD more so. SAMe. SAMe helps the body better metabolize and utilize the serotonin. It also helps with joints and liver function and other things too. But we find oftentimes uh, people that have ADD or ADHD tend to have more uh, depression. And so doing things to bolster the serotonin, like the SAMe, the B6, the good Bs, getting the good bacteria. Um, mind you now, SAMe helps with the um, utilization of serotonin. The bowel produces 70 to 80 percent of the serotonin, not the brain. So it's real important to make sure we have these adequate amounts of good bacteria and good digestion and good foods going in for nutrition and manufacturing of these uh, uh, neurotransmitters that we need in the brain. Some of the testing uh, I'd like to bring to point that I think physicians should run on their patients, be it adults or children, before they start throwing the drugs at them. And that's obviously the food allergy and chemical sensitivity tests, blood iron level tests, uh, digestion, gluten intolerance types of tests. You know, what is the bowel not able to handle? Gluten can cause extreme amounts of inflammation, and inflammation in the brain can contribute to ADD and ADHD. Um, amino acid levels, testing for intestinal permeability. And I've listed on here what types of tests are necessary in order to accomplish the feat you want in testing for these items. For example, a lot of physicians will pull blood for heavy metal uh, testing, and that doesn't cut it without certain types of flushing of the blood, and there's another chemical you have to add in in order to get that heavy metal reading. So hair analysis is much more accurate. When we're contemplating using drugs uh, for ADD or ADHD, in looking at all these factors, we have to recognize the risk factors that go along with using the standard ADD and ADHD drugs, particularly in kids. Increases the risk of future drug addiction because what it does to your child is, once again, it rehardwires them. It hardwires the brain. It gets them set to where, oh, this is normal for us to have this drug the rest of our life. And I'm, I'm not so sure that's a predicament that parents, they, they need to consider before they put their child on any types of drugs. Because long term wise, are we going to need that cocaine to give us that same stimulation that we had with our ADD and ADHD drug medication? It's something that has to be considered and discussed in, in making that decision. It stunts the growth. Um, a lot of the medications I noticed with Augie, with some of his friends that are on these medications, they're considerably smaller than he is. And so those are issues as well, because then you've got to deal with ego issues, particularly for boys, considering this gets boys three times more likely, and other issues. Um, there's a JAMA report about the overusage. We're seeing more and more usage of these types of ADD and ADHD medications for kids between the age of two and four. Oh my gosh, yeah, the, the kids are a little wild, the parents haven't researched any of these other issues, and hey, gee, I want to calm my child down, or I've got the, the kindergartner of first grade, grade or sitting in the chair that's buzzing all over the place, how can we make it easier for the teacher to be able to teach him? Uh-uh. First of all, these other issues need to be addressed. Parents, please, teachers, please, address these issues. Look at the diet. Look at the nutritional supplementation. Look at your options first before you consider drugs because there's far more side effects than what I'm listing down here of the drugs that are utilized for these particular, um, uh, I don't know, you can call it a disability. 
Anyway, I hope that uh, helps clarify. And then once again, please research further and take the responsibility upon yourself to find out more information before you put your child on medications. We'll be moving on to our next segment, which is our fitness portion of our show. To the fitness portion of our show. I got some complaints last week um, when our Cellulite and Varicose Veins show uh, appeared uh, that I didn't show any exercise that might help with the thigh and the inner thigh area for those areas where women and guys tend to collect cellulite. So I'm going to address that issue today. I want to address it in a very safe fashion and I want to remind people that if you have knee problems, please don't do this exercise. This is for someone that has a little stronger, more stable knee. First, I'd like to show a front lunge, and I want to do this in a very safe passion, uh, pattern and show you how to do it properly. What we do is we lunge forward very slowly in a balanced form, and if you have to, you can hold on to something. Um, but what we're trying to do and we're trying to demonstrate is to keep to where you can still see your toes, but you lunge forward and then you lunge back. And you lunge forward still being able to see the top of your toes and you lunge back. And then to work the back thigh area as well, then we can reverse it and reverse back. And see once again, we're looking and being mindful of where our knee is that we're not overextending the knee over those toes because it puts a lot of pressure around the tendons and ligaments. Another helpful exercise for inner thigh and outer thigh as well is to do some side lunges. And those go like this, being very aware once again that you're not letting, you can still see your toes uh, just right at the very, very edge, you lunge, and then push back. And then you alternate on each side, lunge, once again, paying attention to the uh, knees over the toes, and lunge back. What this will do, and if you can do 10 reps of each of those exercises a couple of times every other day, it'll help to tone and get the circulation improvement uh, going on the, uh, the back of the thighs and the front where we tend to collect cellulite. Next, we'll be moving on to our research analyst portion of our show. Welcome to the research portion of our show. With us today is Ralph Turciano. Ralph? Thank you. You all remember a little while back when they tried to say that vitamin C may potentially have an effect at protecting cancer. In fact, it caused a lot of uh, scares among chemotherapy uh, uh, doctors and so along those lines or oncologists. Well, recently, uh, due to the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, they found the exact opposite to be true. When injecting vitamin C, into mice particularly, they said, according to them, it decreased the tumor weight and growth of those tumors by 50%. Not only that, it had an anti-cancer effect in at least 75% of the cancer lines that they tested. In addition to that, well, not only reducing the tumor growth and weight, they also discovered in mice with glioblastomas or brain tumors, which were not treated with vitamin C, 30% had spread. In the vitamin C treated group, keep in mind this is injection, not oral. In the vitamin C treated group, the glioblastoma did not disseminate or spread at all. This according to the National Institute of Health, they said, quote, these these preclinical data provide the firm basis, a first firm basis for advancing pharmacological ascorbate in cancer treatments in humans. Researchers concluded, keep in mind ascorbate is vitamin C. And of course, we all know about the obesity war. But what if there was an outside culprit that you were not aware of? Well, they found out and finally confirmed it in the first human trials. And you heard a lot about it, and you heard it before, but it was MSG. Now, MSG was approved as being safe by the FDA, but the researchers said safe, ironically, does not necessarily conclude that it's healthy. What they did, and this was done by the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the School of Public Health, and it's also published in the monthly journal of obesity. They said they'd known for years that MSG was associated with weight gain. This was the first study to show the direct link. Not only did they show that link, they compensated for physical activity levels, 
calorie intake, body mass, weight, medications, you name it. And still, out of all that, the MSG group end up gaining weight over the non-MSG group. Remember, safe according to the Food and Drug Administration doesn't mean healthy. And MSG goes under a lot of code names, autolyzed yeast, calcium cassinate, hydrolyzed yeast. It's one of those funny things which is tough to find. They could say it's free, but not necessarily. They need to improve those laws. And here's something for the dating scene. What would the smell have to do with dating? A heck of a lot, according to basically the proceedings of the Royal Society of Biological Sciences. Why? Because they discovered that birth control pills change your sense of smell. There's a substance that people can smell and sweat called major histocompatibility complex. How a person normally looks for a mate with this MHC or major histocompatibility complex is they look for ones that are different than themselves. This way the offspring, when they mate, have a greater spectrum of diseases and bacterium and ailments that they're resistant to. What the birth control pills did was change the sense of smell in the females to where they were really basically not hunting for a mate to you know, procreate with. Instead, they chose men which had a similar smell to them. Now here is the part, which is interesting. So that will lead to fertility problems as well as a decreased immune system in the offspring. But this was interesting. When they went off the birth control pills, their sense of smell changed again, and they started looking for those mates which had a different smell than their own, the major histocompatibility complex. Real interesting aspect. Their brains are real funny that way, but they say it's probably a good reason why a lot of relationships fail after people go off for birth control pills. Important one. This is for people with Crohn's disease. There's a disease in cattle called Jones disease. And if I'm pronouncing it right, I hope I am. What they discovered, there's a Macrobacterium avium paratuberculosis. We'll just call it MAP for short. What they discovered is 68% of cattle are infected with this Mycobacterium avium tuberculosis, or MAP. It's also found sevenfold higher in people with Crohn's disease. The concern here to the researchers is that we may have a national epidemic on our hands. They know there's an antagonist in Crohn's disease. They can't figure out what it is. They may have nailed it. All they know is what this one thing does is really begin to stimulate uh, basically the negative effects of people either susceptible and or cause Crohn's disease. And keep in mind, 68% of the cattle have it. And here's the scary part. Those dairy products, milk, cheese, and meats, and everything else that's out there, and other livestock on top of that, in your store shelves, also showed signs of having Macrobacterium avium tuberculosis even after they're pasteurized or homogenized. It's a major health concern for a lot of researchers who are desperately looking for funding for it, and they can't quite seem to get it. So that's something to look out for, and that was some also very much to keep in mind. It's a very sobering one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ralph. And thank you very much for joining the Fit and Healthy Today Show. We once again encourage you to do your further research into each of these topic matters that we've discussed today. And look for it, seek it out, and do something about it. Thank you.